Hey everyone, thanks very much for being here tonight. Today is our first server-side chat. We are really excited for uh, this uh, new meetup group, new community that we are starting. First, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, most of you already know me, but my name is Daniel. I'm uh, the guild leader here for Waze in the area of uh, DevOps and Cloud Engineering. And uh, today we are starting our new group, Server-Side Chat. Uh, it's going to be a group uh, related to backend engineering, uh, involving backend uh, engineer, of course, uh, also data engineering and DevOps. Yes, and cloud. <laughs> Woohoo, DevOps, yes. Uh, <laughs> so this is it. I don't want to make this time uh, so much long, so it's be very ephemeral. See, I can now also use the word from the presentations. <laughs> Uh, so we are going to start, and also using ephemeral again, let's uh, start this ephemeral moment, but not uh, ephemeral knowledge transfer. So big applause for JP. <laughs> JP, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening. So tonight I'm going to talk about this topic, so ephemeral environments for your end-to-end -end tests using Spring Boot. So, yeah, but first, uh, what is ephemeral? So if you didn't get the joke from Daniel, now you will understand what he said. So ephemeral, it's basically something that lasts for a very short time. So yeah, very basic. So something we're curious of what it means. So yeah, this is the, the meaning. If you go to the dictionary, for example, to, to check. And OK, but first, who am I? So I am the one with less hair, so the one from this side here of the picture. <laughs> Uh, my name is João Paulo, but everyone calls me JP. Uh, this is my Twitter account, so if you want to have a conversation about this topic or something else, so you can reach me there. Uh, I'm a Java and Kotlin developer in the last, uh, I think, Java five years. Kotlin lasted three years. In total, 17 years working in IT. So, yeah, I started with uh, ASP, PHP, then C Sharp then Java, then Kotlin, yeah. I also saw Clipper when I was studying, so very old stuff. Clipper Summer 87. <laughs> yeah, so I have a daughter. She's 10 months old, Isabella. This is my wife, and I also have a cat, so yeah. This is a little bit about yeah myself and my experience. Uh, okay, so how many of you are developing Kotlin or already worked with Kotlin in the back end? One, two, three, four, okay, less than half of the people. Okay, nice, but it's growing every time. This is nice. Uh, okay, so why ephemeral environments for your tests? So, because everything in our field, uh, the correct answer is it depends. So, this is why I'm introducing this use case here. So, we can focus this topic, uh, at least the first part, in a very basic example. So, then we can take the right decisions with, if we have a use case. And here we have the API gateway, a service, two databases being used by the service, so relational database, and the Redis to cache stuff. And our goal here is to test this service. So yeah, so we want to write tests to guarantee that this service is working before we go to production. Uh, okay, so what is the usual flow from the local environment to the production environment? And this I saw in some companies that I worked before. And also if you Google about the test environment, so a lot of posts will talk about this, that you need to have a, some different test environments. So the first one is the local environment, where you as a developer is going to write some unit tests uh, using Mokito and JUnit, because you want to mock the external dependencies to make it a unit test. Uh, you might also have some uh, Spring Boot tests using maybe the mock MVC uh, to just call your controller and see if uh, the HTTP requests are working as expected, maybe test if the error messages are okay. Uh, okay, after that you deploy your application to the shared dev environment. So it's uh, an environment running in your company where a lot of teams are deploying their applications there. Some companies do this while you have a pull request still open. Some companies will uh, only deploy to the dev environment after you uh, approve the pull request, for example. So it depends. I saw both of scenarios already. 
and there you can do some exploratory tests, okay, just call the API to see if the results are what you expect. And there you also have the databases, so the database is running with real data there, not real data, the test data there. Uh, then after that you deploy this to the staging environment, and some companies they have the QA role, so some people that uh, work uh, doing testing the applications, basically. And they might have uh, automated tests to do the end-to-end -end test for you. They also take care of the data, so creating scenarios with the data there. And uh, after this environment, you finally go to production. And in the production environment, you can uh, use some strategies to reduce the risk of uh, putting some yeah, issues in production and have uh, like uh, uh, sad users, for example, because yeah. And then there you can use, for example, the canary release. So a canary is basically, so you, if you have 10 instances of your application running there, you put one extra there and you keep monitoring that uh, application, that instance to see if the metrics are okay. So if it's behaving like expected, if it's okay, you can just put more instances there. And, oh, and this instance, you only put maybe 1% of the traffic if you have like a, a hundreds of requests per second or 5%, then you can choose. After that, then you just do the deployment, the rolling deployment, changing the previous version to this new version. Or you can also use the blue-green deployment. And in this scenario, you, for example, have 10 instances running there for, from version one that you call blue. Then you deploy 10 new instances of the green, so the version two that uh, you have your new feature. Then you switch traffic from here to here. And if something goes wrong, you can just switch back to here because this is still running, so this is very fast. So this is a way to recover uh, as fast as possible in the production environment, so this is really nice. And of course, this is the best environment to test because yeah, this is production, so all the real data is there. <laughs> but don't tell your boss that you are testing in production. Tell, oh, I'm going to validate something there because they, yeah, <laughs> might uh, get it wrong if you say that you are testing in production. <laughs> uh, okay, so what are the issues in this scenario that uh, some companies uh, still use? So the first one is that, okay, your team is using this environment but you have also another team, and another team, and another team. And because of that, this environment is too unstable, and you don't have control over the data that is there, so you might spend maybe three hours creating a test scenario, and then when you are going to use that data, maybe another team already consumed that data, so this is really, really, yeah, bad, because you are basically wasting time instead of uh, doing something productive. Uh, but of course, uh, here we have one service, two databases, but in reality, some companies, it's like this. So a lot of services with a lot of teams, and some companies are more like this than so big companies. So yeah, this is a very complex environment, so really difficult to maintain. And this is, yeah, one of the issues. And besides that, those environments also cost money, 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 money. Of course, this one is production, so it's more expensive, but this is the one that is also giving money for the company, so yeah, this is why. But uh, yeah, those still cost uh, a lot of money for the companies, of course. So let's start then. Just remember, so this is our use case that we're going to see here in the demo. And uh, our goal here is to remove this environment. We could also remove the second one, the shared uh, a staging environment, but uh, for now, let's focus on this one. And uh, to do that, to improve the reliability to go to production with uh, more confidence, we want to bring to the local environment some end-to-end -end tests and the databases that we have in the dev environment. So this is what we, we want to do here. Okay, so let's go to the demo first. Okay, so this is the use case number one. Uh, if we see here in the pwn.xml, I'm using Maven, and the language that I'm using here is Kotlin. I'm going to make it bigger. So, yeah, so this is just a Spring Boot application. Here I have uh, my source code. It's a Kotlin application, and I just uh, put all the code in the same file just to make it easier to show to you, but yeah, this is not a good idea to do in production, of course. 
so here is just a Spring Boot application. So here we have our main methods. Here it's my table, so that I map into the Postgres database. So I have an ID, the content, the created at the repository that's gonna uh, retrieve data from the database and put data there. My REST controller that is using this yeah, message repository that was defined here. The Redis template, so this I'm getting for free from, from Spring just because I'm using the Redis is Spring Boot Starter dependence there. So no configuration needed for this. Then I have my get map, my get mapping here. So I just get a random message. Uh, then I'm increasing this counter here in Redis. So I'm just using Redis here to, yeah, to do something with that. So this is being used by statistics. And this is a very, of course, dumb application only for demo purpose. So yeah, this is why it's like this without services, without uh, yeah, the good practices, of course. Uh, then I'm just returning the content of the message, uh, and if it's new, I'm just gonna return a default value, so hello world. Here, I can check how many times this endpoint was called because it's gonna return the counter. And this is just a random message. And if you go here to the resource folder, I'm using Flyway to uh, take care of my database structure. So I'm creating this table here using Flyway. And I'm just inserting the hello world message in different uh, languages. So Spanish, Italian, Dutch, uh, uh, French, uh, and others. And what happens if I just run this application here? So let's see if the demo gods are with us today. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> so here we can see that something is happening. So it's basically, oh, it was too fast to show, but here we can see that uh, uh, flyway. Bum, bum, bum. So basically Docker CLI. So our application is communicating with Docker and it's, it's starting the two databases that we have as a dependency here. So if I just go to the browser now, uh, let's open the browser. And if I go here, localhost 8080, hello. We can see Italian, Dutch, Portuguese, so it's working. And if you go to the statistics endpoint, so the connection with Redis is also working because we can see the counter here. So both integrations, so without any configuration, Spring did a lot of magic for us because we have this dependency here. So let's go back to the point. Oh, this is not the correct use case, this one. So here we have one dependency called Spring Boot Docker Compose. And we have this scope at runtime because we don't want to ship this to production. So when we compile our application, this is gonna, not gonna be there. But what it does, so I have this compose.yaml file here in the root folder. And here I'm telling, okay, I want a Postgres database. Don't do that using latest. Use the same version that you have in the production environment, of course, because test environment should be as close as possible to production. Uh, just some configurations about my database, the port, that uh, inside the container is being exposed, and I'm not mapping to a specific port in my local machine. I'm just using one that is available there. Same thing for Redis, so don't use latest, and here I'm just using a random port uh, in my host machine. And then Spring Boot can just uh, create a service connection, and it's gonna be available in my application to be used at uh, local development or at a test uh, as well. And yeah, this is really nice because it, it speeds up uh, things for us. And of course, we can then have the same uh, version, the same databases that are running in production. Some people like to use H2 for tests or for running it locally, but you might have issues in production because yeah, maybe you are trying to do something locally and in production, yeah, it's gonna behave a little bit different. Uh, okay, so what happens if we run our tests? So here I have some, not some, only one test. So let's put this here. So just a test that should return a message. Uh, it's a Spring Boot test, as you can see here. Running a random port. I'm injecting the rest, uh, test REST template just to do the API call and checking if it's okay. So if I just run this test, what do you think is gonna happen? 
Is it gonna succeed? Or yes. It's gonna fail. Succeed. Succeed. Okay. We let's believe see. in you. I don't believe in me. Let's see. And it failed. Why? Because to use the Docker Compose in the tests, we need an extra configuration. So if you go to the resource folder here, and I uncomment this. So we need to tell to this dependence, okay, I also want you to run in the tests. So basically, Compose is keeping tests to set to false. Now I, it should work. <laughs> then if you just run it, and it's green now. So what happened? So same thing when we run up the application locally. So Spring is going to start all the containers that you have defined inside your Docker Compose file. And after that, it's going to start your application, then run your test. So this is really yeah, helpful. And this way, you guarantee that you are running the same thing when you run the application locally to do some exploratory tests. Also, when you run it uh, in your pipeline. Because if you just run a Maven verify here, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to start all the dependencies, then start your application, then run the test. So you can just configure in our pipeline the Maven verify command, and it's going to be running the same way that you run in your local machine. So this is really nice, really cool. So without uh, much effort, you can do this with uh, this dependency. But of course, in a real application, we don't have just uh, yeah, one or two database connect to our application. We also have, uh, oh, before that, I ignore the API gateway. So in the first picture, we said, OK, we have an API gateway that serves in two databases. But in this test, I'm calling my application directly without an API gateway. So how can we also include this in our tests to make it like end-to-end -end, so from the gateway until the database? So this is why you have the use case number two here. It is still the same application, so the hello, not this one, this one. Just the hello. The difference now that we are receiving this X custom header is just something that the API gate is going to send to us, and I can just uh, uh, log so we can see that the, the header is there. And then I have uh, changed this application a little bit. Now it's a multi-module application, so this is why I have app here, then the gateway. And if I open the pon.xml, we can also see, okay, that we have two modules there. And the gateway that we have here, it's just a Spring Boot application as well. It's a very dumb API gateway because, yeah, this is just for example. Oh, let's make it bigger, maybe. Oh, no, it's already there. So it's, I have uh, the hello endpoint that's going to call the hello in the real application and just going to return the result here. So this is what it does. And this is also included here in the Docker Compose. But as we can see here, this is going to build a Docker image that we have in the gateway Docker file. That is this Docker file here. So this is a multi-stage Docker file. So first we build our application inside the Docker image. Then we copy the jar file to another uh, Docker image, so we can run it there. So, and then with this Docker file, we can tell Docker Compose, okay, I want you to build this for me and run this as well and expose this in a port. Here I'm using a specific port because the Spring Boot Docker Compose dependency only has uh, this automatic integration of some databases and messaging systems. So in the documentation, they list all of them. So I'm not going to get a service connection automatically with this service. So we need to configure our application. OK, this is the part of the dependency, for example. This is why I'm using a specific one here. And also, this is a difference. So in the other ones, we don't have these extra hosts here. This is necessary because the gateway is running inside Docker, but our application is running locally in our machine. So we need to tell uh, to add this extra configuration to tell that uh, the gateway can call the host machine. And this is how we do, do that. So this is just a name that you can choose. I choose prox host. And then you should map this to the host gateway. So it's basically telling, it's kind of a DNS. So you say, OK, this name here should uh, uh, go to the host IP address, something like that. Uh, then, of course, in the gateway application, instead of local host, I'm also using this name here. Because then, OK, it's going to go to the 
to the host machine instead of calling local host inside the container that is kind of a virtual machine. And yeah, so let's see what happens if we just run this application. Uh, not this one, the app. This is probably going to take a little bit more time because it's going to build the... Oh, I forgot to do something, then it's going to fail. So first let's stop the previous one. Otherwise it's going to complain that it's running the same port. Uh, use case number two, okay, now we can just run this application. And again, this is starting all the dependencies. Oh, it was really fast. It might have something wrong. Let's see. No, no, it's there. Oh yeah, of course I did, uh, I ran this today. So then it's already cached, then it's really fast. So this is also something that is nice. So first time it can take some seconds, maybe a um, few minutes, but then the next time it's really fast. So here we have the Redis, Postgres and the gateway running. And if you go back to the browser, instead of calling our application directly, we call the gateway in the hello endpoint because this, this is the only one that I have exposed there. Then it's also calling our service. So Portuguese, Dutch, English. And if we go to the logs here, we can also see that the header, it's there now. So it's not empty anymore because here in our gateway, we are we have it hard coded here, okay? So also send this header with this value. So this is a way that you can also implement things that are uh, in front of your application in this kind of test. So this is really, really cool. But of course, this is just a part of the story, right? Because we have also more complex scenarios than that. And a very common scenario that we might have in those days, it's the calling a third party service. So yeah the services, they don't yeah, exist by themselves anymore. You need to call other services maybe to consult, uh, to get information from another system. So how can we implement the third party service? Here, I chose to, I have chosen to use a different approach than the gateway. So here, as you can see, I only have a JSON file. I know that uh, DevOps people, they don't like JSON or YAML, so, but yeah. <laughs> but for simple stuff, it's nice. Yeah, for complex stuff, this is a nightmare, of course. <laughs> but if you have just a simple thing that you need to get a response, a request and a specific response without any logic, this is nice because this is using Wiremock and you can just tell Wiremock, okay, this map in here. So every time that I receive a request, uh, get request in this URL, you just return for me a 200 with this body and those headers. And here in the Docker Compose file, we are just using the wire mock image and also mapping this folder here, mappings to the internal folder inside the container. Then it's gonna just uh, work as expected. Of course, if you have a more complex scenario, you can also do the same thing that we did for the gateway. Just create an application, put some logic there, and then it's gonna work. Of course, then you don't need these extra hosts here. Uh, and But I think you should only do that if it's really needed because with uh, Wiremock, you have less code to maintain. So this is also a good thing. You can just use other people's stuff, right? To make uh, things uh, simpler. So yeah, so this is a very straightforward uh, one. So if we just run the application now. Oh yeah, and the application now changed it because we have also the goodbye endpoint that is calling a REST template that is configured here. So this is the third party REST template that is calling the port that we have defined there in the wire mock. So if we run this application, The other one. Ah, you learned it fast. <laughs> oh, it stopped it already. So something is... So let's close this, the use case one. Use case two we don't need anymore. What happened here?
Oh, it was driver failed, external connectivity and points. Oh, it's all right. Ah, okay. I have something running on this part, so we can just do something like uh, Q port uh, 9092. Let's see. It should be okay. Maybe. Let's see also the Docker. Ah, uh, they are still running there. Okay, just stop this. Now it should work, I expect that. Oh, it was already running there. Also. Stop. Okay, this is what is expected, right? When you see a demo, so things mm -hmm. goes wrong all the time. <laughs> uh, at least it's not in the production environment, so we don't have any incident open. So yeah. Yeah. If your if your cell didn't ring, it's okay. What? If your cell phone didn't ring. No, yet, no, that's yeah, okay. no pager duty call. So this is okay. <laughs> okay, now it's working as expected. So if we go there, everything is running. And then if we call the goodbye endpoint, I'm gonna call directly in the application because I don't have this one mapped in my gateway. Then we can just do the goodbye, enter, and it's working. So now we are calling our application. Our application is calling a third party service that we mock it, of course. And why are we doing this? Because we want to have control over the dependencies around our application. So the important thing that we want to test, it's our application. Of course, you need to know very well how the dependencies work. And this is, yeah, can be a little bit difficult if the, for example, if you have a third party that provides you a Docker image of a stub or a real application that works locally, nice. I have never seen that, to be honest. So <laughs> this is some kind of a dream. But then if it's like another team inside your company, maybe you can uh, yeah, just uh, read the open API specification that they have, if they have. Otherwise, it, you need to talk to them, okay, how does it work? So what's the expected uh, request and responses and then? But of course, if they are providing something for you to use, they will have the open API specification at least. Uh, okay, so this is nice, but we still have uh, something that, uh, a use case that is also very common. So everything nowadays, it's running on cloud. And we also use a lot of services from the cloud. So databases, messaging systems, yeah, a lot of stuff that you can name it. Uh, API Gateway, for example. So this is why we have the use case number four here. And this is basically using the SQS. This is a queue system for, from AWS. So you can publish a message there, you can list into a message there, publish there in a specific uh, queue. And how can you test uh, a scenario like this? So let's stop everything just to avoid issues. Here, here. Shut down complete. Yeah. So use case number four. What do we have here? Again, the same application as we can see here. Uh, let's make it smaller. The difference now is that we have stuff here, so not this. So we have the SQS configuration to create an SQS client, so we can publish message there and also consume message there. Of course, you can also use the Spring Boot integration to do that, just using that list annotation. Should also work. And here, I'm using this local host uh, 45666. What it means? What is this? So if you are using AWS, you are lucky because they have a kind of emulator available. It's not from AWS itself. It's a company called LocalStack and they provide a Docker image that you can use in your Docker Compose file. So you just need some configuration like uh, the services that you want to uh, enable. Otherwise, it's going to enable all the services there. Uh, the region, region default one, the edge port, and just uh, yeah, expose the port here. And this one I just got from the documentation, so but yeah, it's also necessary to put here. Then, of course, in the real application, you are not going to put the hard-coded value here. Then it's going to be in a configuration. 
and then I have the this component here that is the just creating our queue, so we can just publish a message there and so then listen to the messages. You can also use Terraform or CDK that I learned from Daniel's talk yesterday to do that as well. You just need to point that to the local stack, then it's going to create for you as well. But then, of course, you might run it manually or maybe put a plugin in Maven to try to run that. I'm not sure if it's possible. But here, again, just for demo purposes, it's here. Uh, then you have the publisher. So this is going to publish uh, one message every one second. And the message is just the, oops, the current date time in the queue. And then the listener, every five seconds, it's going to consume 10 messages at maximum there, as you can see here. And it's going, all of them is just going to print uh, messages with the log so we can see what's happening. So then you can just start this application. And here stuff uh, uh, is happening. And one thing that I saw uh, in the, some of the examples here, they expose a lot of ports. I think it's the ports from the services itself. If you do that, uh, it's not going to work. At least in my machine, it didn't work. So it's staying that uh, healthy message, then it just time out and the application, yeah doesn't work locally, so yeah. But if you just specify this part, it, it, it works. As expected, so yeah, we can see the logs. Something is happening here. So publishing, 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 then those uh, dashes here is the consumer consuming and printing the messages. So also works really nice. So you can also mock stuff from the cloud. And then you might ask, okay, I'm not using AWS. I'm using Azure or GCP. What should they do? Because they don't uh, have a similar tool like this. Uh, the nice and the good thing, it's everything, it's HTTP uh, nowadays. So all the services from Azure, from GCP, they are just uh, REST API calls. Maybe not REST, but API calls. So you can do the same thing that we did for the gateway, just to try to create a stub for them if it's not available. And of course, uh, if it's something that's really difficult to do this, you can also tested maybe in the production environment, not test, validate in production, or of course in the staging environment because yeah, you can just spawn some kind of environment uh, there, also ephemeral environment, of course. I have a Terraform that just spawns the thing that you really need in the cloud environment. Uh, then you just run a very small uh, set of tests there. So the goal here, is to shift tests to left as much as possible and only do the end to end using real things if it's really needed, if you cannot mock them locally. So why you should do that? Because, well, it's gonna speed things for you. You will have a, a much more reliable environment so you can control the data here, for example. We are using the flyway. So you can have a profile for your local environment that's gonna just put all the data that you need for your test there. So this is really, really cool. And because we are inside the Spring, uh, so here, for example, in the tests, it's just a Spring. So you can just also auto-wire stuff from your application and just insert data for the tests there. So remove data to the cleanups before each run. This way you will have uh, very stable tests because no one likes flake tests. Because what happens if you have flake tests, people will disable them or you start ignoring them. And uh, building those tests, tests were it was just a waste of time for you. You could be maybe yeah, doing something more useful. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the presentation then. So end-to-end -end or integration tests. So yeah, the title of this presentation is end-to-end -end tests, but some people, they might say, okay, this, is, uh, this might be an integration test because if you have a front-end, for example, I'm not covering it here. So yeah, the goal here was to cover only the Spring Boot application. So, but again, the message here is that you should shift your test left and do as less uh, the minimum amount of end-to-end uh, -end tests possible. So this is the, the message that I want to pass. And then just to summarize, uh, shift to left testing. So yeah, I said it, it already. Do, so we have that test parameter. So it's basically, 
the base it's unit tests, then integration tests, then the top is the end-to-end -end test. So it's a really something useful to, to have in mind. And if you do that, uh, DevOps people will be happy because if they really love this shift to left thing. <laughs> uh, take control of your dependencies. So yeah, this is the best way that you can uh, uh, don't have uh, flake tests in your environment because if you take control of all the dependencies around your application, you can have more reliable tests. And as we could see, Spring Boot loves Docker Compose, so the integration is really nice. With databases to run it locally or with tests, you don't even need to configure the connection strings, the username and the password, so in your application. And we also saw this already, of course, uh, if you do that, uh, you can miss one scenario because you're using a lot of uh, stubs and mocked stuff. So to go to production, you should uh, use uh, the canary deployment of, for example, to go in a less risky way to production. And uh, of course, shit will happen and you should be able to recover fast. And the blue green deployment is a nice way to do that. So I already talked about that. And yeah, this is it. Thank you. Here I have two posts on uh, the ways uh, LinkedIn. So this one is about this talk. And of course, you can achieve the same thing that we saw here with Docker, without Docker. And I have an article for that. So basically using just a Spring uh, a Maven multi-module project with sub-modules that you can start before running your test. So this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, GP. Uh, we are going to start with a round of questions, uh, but I have the first one. Okay. Can I do it? Yes, sure. Coming from DevOps guy. Okay, okay. <laughs> what should be more ephemeral, this, those environments or my hair? <laughs> no, okay, no, just kidding, but... Uh, this one's difficult. <laughs> this is difficult, right? Yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience? So, and now I'm really happy that I have uh, this microphone, so I can uh, give it to you. It's, yeah, so yeah, nice presentation, JP. Thank you. Um, my question is, this love between Spring Boot and, and Docker Compose started in recent uh, versions. How can we achieve that uh, like in older versions of Spring Boot? Is there another way to, to have ephemeral tests like that? Okay, yeah, really great qu question. So this uh, uh, dependency was released with Spring 3.1 version. And what it does is basically running the Docker Compose uh, up uh, or start or something like that. Then when the everything finishes, it's gonna uh, stop uh, the Docker Compose. You can achieve that just uh, in older versions. So you can have the Docker Compose file in the root folder. You just run Docker Compose uh, start uh, in the beginning, run your application or your test, then you stop it. So this is just... Uh, something to automate that step so you don't feel that it's happening, but a lot of stuff is happening. But you can achieve the same thing in any programming language, any framework, if you just do a Docker Compose start in the beginning and in the end. So everything that I talked here about uh, how to do stuff with your uh, dependencies, you can achieve in any other language or framework, just doing starting the Docker Compose and stopping in the end. So, yeah. The mic, man. Would be using test containers like the same thing? Uh, yeah, you can also use test containers to do that. Then you don't need a Docker Compose file. You are going to write uh, your configuration using Java, Kotlin, the language that we are using. Uh, so yeah, it's possible to achieve the same using the Docker uh, Compose, but then it's gonna work only, not Docker Compose, the Docker test, test containers, thank you. But then it's gonna work only for your tests. Not if you just run an application, then you need to do something manual there. So yeah, the biggest difference is that this one works for tests and also for running your application locally to do some to see how it works. Because the worst thing that can happen, and it happened with me in some companies, you arrive there, so you are new in the area, and you have to do 35 steps to set up your machine to run one application. So this is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes, uh, I go around, 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 and here we are. Thank you. 
uh, nice presentation, GP. Uh, in the very beginning, you mentioned that the idea is mainly remove the dev environment by the end-to-end. -end. I'd like to know if you have the experience, you had the experience before of uh, on a real-world uh, uh, scenario where you had the dev environment and you really remove that and you could replace it fully and all the capabilities involved on that by the end-to-end -end tests. And if you could uh, give us a bit a brief about this experience, how to go, what was the, the downsides, what were the challenges that you faced while you're trying to achieve that to really get rid of the dev environment. Okay, yeah, great question. So basically, uh, if you do that, uh, you might, uh, for example, in your dev environment, you can have uh, some, I don't know, some access rules configured in your cloud. So this can be a challenge that you cannot uh, maybe replicate uh, locally, even using the local stack, because local stacks just ignores everything about security, because no one cares about security. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a challenge, probably, because when you just mock everything, you are, of course, uh, removing some stuff that uh, exists in the dev environment. You might also assume or understand something wrong and do it in your test, then when you go to production, it's different. This is why I also said, okay, go carefully to production using some kind of nice strategies to uh, mitigate issues there. But uh, yeah, those I think are the biggest challenges. And in my current uh, uh, team, we still have the dev environment, but uh, we just run our application there the same way that we run it locally. And we don't have other applications connecting to us there. So this is something that is already very useful. So you, and we don't have the dev environment and already production environment. So if you are in a team that has three environments, at least one of them you can remove, like I show dev uh, staging and production. Uh, but uh, yeah, and in my current uh, a team we have uh, we run the tests there, but it's basically in our Maven configuration we have uh, two configurations. If the profile is local, it's going to be local host and the port number. If it's running in the dev environment, we just uh, have a different URL, but the tests are all the same, so we run the same stuff. We are also using the same stubs that we run locally in this dev environment. So, yeah, but we don't really need I think this environment. I think it, it could also be removed, but of course, because it's a very sensitive information, we have uh, some millions of requests per, I forgot the amount of time. But uh, yeah, it, you should also consider the risk of your application, of course. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I have a real question, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, because, yeah, uh, thinking more about uh, the DevOps part, uh, usually uh, different applications communicate with common applications. So we could have three applications communicating with uh, the same uh, third party services. Yeah. And then if I need to implement the stub, he needs to implement the stub, everything needs to implement the stub. So is there a way to put this in something common that people can uh, reuse it between teams or something like this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, great question. So. Uh, thinking about this specific scenario where we are using Docker, uh, a really nice way is should be, okay, I'm a team that I'm providing uh, APIs for other teams, so I, I can create my own stub and publish in a Docker container registry of your company, for example. Then you just write a nice documentation so others can see, okay, I can just use that stub for, from that uh, team. And usually, in my current uh, team, we have a stubs that we provide to other teams. It's not using Docker because we are not running inside uh, Kubernetes or Docker stuff. We use uh, uh, something different. Uh, it's called Cloud for uh, Clouds. I will remember the name, but it's something that I own. Yeah, some a few companies still use. Uh, then, yeah, this is the way that should be so. In a perfect world, if I'm providing a service for you, I also provide this stub or the application in a way that it can run locally. So it can be also the real application if it's possible. If you don't have a lot of external dependence, of course, then you can just publish there and people can consume your, your Docker image. Really nice. Any other questions? No? So I would like to ask uh, again a big applause for GP. Okay.
for GP. Thank you very much. Oh, I have a gift for you. Thank you. And I would like uh, to thank, uh, again, Waze uh, for hosting this event and also for sponsoring it. Uh, we are going to have uh, some beers and pizza uh, now. And also, I'm going to stay away from the QR code because I'm a big one. Uh, also, I'd like to invite everyone for already the next event uh, that we're going to have. It's going to be on April 18th uh, here in Eindhoven. So forecasting and optimization in the energy sector to be really nice. Uh, hope I can see everyone uh, in the next meeting. And I think that's it. Thank you everyone and let's go for the drinks and pizzas.